Friends, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming in person or virtually to join us for today's Lunch and Learn. I know that our conversations are amazing and being physically with one another is so exciting. And I'm just so glad to see all of you talking, eating, enjoying being together today. There will be more time for just hanging out after our presentation, but first, our presentation. Dr. Lara Rabinovich Newman is a writer and historian who specializes in immigrant food cultures. She earned her PhD in Jewish food history from NYU. I would like that PhD as well. <laughs> she earned her PhD in 2012 and has helped create a variety of projects from books to film, digital media to live programming. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, in Sever Magazine, in Vice, and in other outlets. Her work as a curator has also appeared at the New York Historical Society in the form of I'll Have What She's Having, the Jewish Deli experience that so many of us went to see when it was on view. She worked for several years for Google, implementing culinary data on Southern California restaurants for the Maps app. She was consulting producer on a 2016 Sundance and independent film channel documentary feature, City of Gold, about the Pulitzer Prize winning food writer, Jonathan Gold. And she served as the Southern California and Canada editor for Alice Waters' book, Truth, Love, and Clean Cutlery. Dr. Newman is with us today to talk about Delhi, about memory, and about identity. Let's welcome her. So, Will, is my screen up, Will? So what do I do? Let me get it. Oh, I am okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Rabbi Berman. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, thank you to Rabbi Kaplan and the rest of the team for inviting me here. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so today I am going to talk about a subject that I think is beloved to, uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a subject that I think is beloved uh, to many of you, the Jewish Deli. Um, and I'm going to do that by telling you specifically about an exhibition I co-curated about the history and culture of the Jewish Deli that is currently touring the United States. Um, I'm going to give you a sort of bird's eye view uh, of some of the ideas we cover in the exhibition. And I also want to give you some time for questions at the end. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to give you uh, some, some, I'm going to sort of go through my presentation and at the end, we'll have time for questions. I'm going to start with a video that I filmed, a very short video that I filmed at the press tour we hosted when the exhibition opened at the New York Historical Society last November. In this video, you will see Jake Dell, who is the fifth generation owner of Katz's Deli, of course, here in New York City. And in the background, you'll probably recognize Meg Ryan. Okay, so I'm going to try and play this video. Here we go. Oh, that's not the video. Were you there when they were filming? Uh, yeah. Uh, a father and uncle of this. They said, this is what happened. We're cute. We all have our own time. And we were just talking. There was, you know, they're shut down for the day. All the other was. And at one point, those uh, online said, all right, get out of the way. I want to tell you how I actually went up. So they took the screen off and saw Ryan and all. Mother is 
Okay, so there's a lot going on in this video. Jake, who is the young and current owner of Katz's Deli, is standing in our exhibition on the Jewish Deli next to the artist Alan Wolfson's miniature model of Katz's Deli, which is on display. And he's, of course, describing that famous scene in the 1989 film by Rob Reiner, When Harry Met Sally, and for which our exhibition took its title, I'll Have What She's Having, The Jewish Deli. Of course, this is the famous line uttered by Reiner's mother, Estelle Reiner. So Katz's Deli was already a landmark when this film came out. It opened in 1888. But since then, it has become a tourist attraction with visitors lining up to sit where Meg Ryan famously enjoyed, shall we say, her deli sandwich while Billy Crystal looked on in shock. Of course, this is sort of a meta video where Jake, many generations later, is telling us about that experience of filming that scene while the clip plays in the background. So I'd like to use this example as a starting point for two main points I'd like to make today. One, the Jewish deli is an American phenomenon. And today, the Jewish deli is part of the American urban and cultural landscape. In other words, Jewish deli is not a European institution that was brought over here and replicated, but rather it was created here. Two, the history of the Jewish deli is a story of both tradition and of change. So today we will outline some of these traditions and some of these changes. So let's start at the beginning. In nearly every major city in the United States, there is or has been at least one Jewish deli. But of course, New York City has been the spiritual home of the Jewish deli, much as it was the immigrant hub. All right, now I'm going to go back to my slides. Oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. Hmm. I will, I'm, I'm messing up again, I'm sorry. I, I promise you after this, I won't, I won't be messing up. All right, here we go. So here on Orchard Street, this is a postcard of Orchard Street on the Lower East Side from approximately 1900. Jewish Delhi is a story of immigration and adaptation. The evolution of the Jewish Delhi follows the European Jewish immigration story. Originally, Jewish delis were humble lunch spots. They arose out of this immigrant context in some ways. Many began as push carts on the street or as street vendors much like this. This, uh, this is an image from also around 1900 as well. These are images, many of these images I'm gonna show you today are taken from the exhibition. The term delicatessen, however, begins with the German immigration to the United States in the 19th century. The term delicatessen is German in origin. It is a German origin word and shop. Delicatessen is roughly translated as a store for edible delicacies. German delicatessen stores, much like the one you see here, sold specialty and prepared goods as well as cured meats and occasionally sandwiches. These were similar to stores uh, in German lands as well, the ones much like this one in New York. This is an image of Shapiro's delicatessen in Indianapolis. This is the second generation owner, Abe Shapiro, in front of Shapiro's delicatessen uh, from 1932. Uh, you can see the cured meats as well as the canned goods specialty goods, typical German Jewish delicatessen shop. So Jewish delicatessen, as we came to know it, was something a bit different than this though. Jewish deli in North America over time became more associated with a blend of European, of Eastern European Jewish cultures and this German delicatessen shop. Jewish delicatessen restaurants, as we came to know them in the early 20th century, served foods from regions across Eastern and Central Europe, all under one roof. For example, 
alongside German salami was also perhaps Romanian pastrami or Ukrainian borscht or smoked fish, eventually Polish gefilte, Polish gefilte fish. Here, for example, is something more along the lines of what I'm talking about. This is Sussman and Love Deli in Baltimore in the 1930s. This intermingling of foods, this Romanian pastrami, Ukrainian borscht, Polish kefilte fish, all these different kinds of foods from across Eastern and Central Europe could only have occurred in the new world in the context of immigration. Eventually, Jewish delis like Sussman and Lev became not just shops, but small gathering spots for a quick meal, a place for new immigrants, or the children of immigrants to have an inexpensive lunch or eventually dinner. They became community gathering spots where immigrants could find common ground. In the early years of the 20th century, eventually the early decades of the 20th century, Jewish delis were also associated with the labor movement. There was a lot of crossover. For example, in this photo, we have the executive board of Bagel Workers Union of New York and New Jersey from 1940. Jewish deli owners, butchers, bagel workers, many of them were active in the labor movement as well. So Jewish deli in the early years of the 20th century was a community hub for Jewish immigrants, and it brought together foods from across Eastern and Central Europe, much like the immigrant mix itself. But one of the most dramatic differences in this immigrant experience was the relative abundance of food in America, and specifically meat. This stood in contrast to immigrants' experience of Europe. Beef was rarely available in Europe. In Europe, beef was not available to the same extent as it was in the Western world. Most Eastern European Jews ate meat at most once a week or poor cuts of beef. Uh, the quantities were very different than what the, was available in, in this part of the world. One of the factors uh, that drew immigrants to the United States was not necessarily the riches. You know, we hear of the, the streets are paved with gold. That's you know, a myth, of course, but that the reality was that you could feed your family. To vastly oversimplify, especially just for our purposes, the land here meant essentially more food. The territorial expansion of the West and the growth of the cattle industry translated to an abundance of food, a relative abundance of food, and specifically meat in this country. Uh, one, one area that we focus on in the exhibition, for example, is Chicago as the gate, one of the gateways to the West, Vienna Beef Smokehouse. Here's an image from 1913, uh, Vienna, also known as Vienna Sausage, 1928. For our purposes, the, uh, this expansion of the meat industry of the United States, for our purposes, meant the exponential growth of Jewish delis during the mid-century, numbering in the tens of thousands during this period. This growth also, of course, meant the expansion of Jewish deli menus into sort of what I would call paradises of corned beef, liver, tongue, brisket, roast beef, steak, salami, and so on. Here's an example. Uh, moving on in the, in the mid-century, uh, this is a menu from Second Avenue Deli probably familiar to many of you. Um, we also have at this period, the expansion also late, Abe, uh, an image of here of late Abe Lee Wall, the founder and owner of Second Avenue Deli. These kinds of proportions, I, I realize this is a later photo, but uh, this is also a later photo from Carnegie, Carnegie Deli. And we'll, we'll come back to this, but just to, to sort of give you a sense of the kinds of proportions that I'm talking about, uh, even today, you wouldn't see this kind of proportions in Europe, right? So um, <laughs> this is this is truly an American phenomenon. Is what I'm getting at. Okay. 
In this period, uh, during the mid-century, mid-20th century, uh, we also began to see the expansion of Jewish deli in other ways as well. This was what I would like to call what we call in the exhibition, the golden era of Jewish deli. This is when Jewish delis also become popular with non-Jewish populations as well. They expand beyond that Jewish immigrant niche that I was talking about a few moments ago. So not unrelatedly, this is also when we begin to see Jewish delis move outside of Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, we see Jewish delis move into actually quite prominent tourist locations of major cities like New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. Perhaps most famously, uh, delis begin to move near the Broadway theaters, not just in their Jewish enclaves. We have, for example, the Stage Deli. This is a menu from 1956. Stage Deli opened in 1937 on the corner of 54th Street and 7th Avenue. Um, and then we have Ruben's Deli, which Ruben's Restaurant, I guess it was known as, but it was really a deli, um, which opened uh, in 1952, and it was named for its owner, Arnold, Rumer, uh, Arnold Rubin, which became a fixture of Manhattan um, with its uh, dining room on the corner of 58th and Park Avenue. This deli was a favorite among the celebrity crowd and the menu featured uh, very expensive and non-kosher foods like lobster alongside corned beef sandwiches. So Rubens tapped into the power of celebrity by naming sandwiches after stars of the day, a practice that delis, other delis later adopted. So this is when we also really begin to see uh, the relationship between pop culture and Jewish delis begin to blossom. Many actors were Jewish and the physical proximity of the theaters and the delis meant that actors and writers frequented the delis regularly. And in New York, at least, deli became synonymous with Broadway. Uh, iconic delis in New York City's theater districts, such as Rubens, Lindy's, Carnegie Deli, and the stage delicatessen became hubs for Broadway theater types and theater patrons. And as um, business boomed, these restaurants at the scene for schmoozing and networking, and some even hosted stand-up comedy. So they really became this crossover zone between Broadway and Delhi. And um, as, as Milton Parker, the owner of Carnegie Deli, liked to say, they named a world-famous concert hall after us. So... Um, <laughs> Celebrity characters graced the pages of the menus and signed headshots, which they put up on the walls. Uh, this is quite a different uh, scene than, than that early, those early years and the early delis that we talked about uh, before. So food inspired the theater, theater inspired the food. Lindy's Cheesecake um, gained nationwide, oh, so this Carnegie Deli, yeah. Lindy's Cheesecake, uh, gained nationwide, nationwide acclaim and in part through Damon Runyon's comedic bid in Guys and Dolls in 1932 with Mindy's as the close st uh, stand-in for Lindy's. This was also uh, a period of dramatic population growth in the United States and dramatic population growth in the Jewish population as well, post-war period. I like to call it suburbanization, secularization, and sunbathing. Um, delis followed the Jews out of the inner cities as well. Uh, this was also the period when kosher went out of style. So not only did cheesecake become part of deli fare, but you would find balinces alongside brisket or bagels, lox, and cream cheese on the same menu as pastrami and corned beef. Jewish, Jewish delis also cropped up in the Sun Belt, in Florida, in Chicago. These delis were often modern and large, like other big American diners cropping up in the period uh, and other restaurants of the time. Some of you might know Wolfie's, might remember Wolfie's Rascal House in Miami Beach. Um, Rascal House was, of course, a famously a haven for both snowbirds and mobsters, like Bugsy Siegel and Mayor Lansky. Another example uh, from this era, Sherman's Deli in Palm Springs, California, also of that modernist period. Um, this was also a period when delis began to appear on the silver screen as well. 
This was already evident with Lindy's, which had an, had appeared in an episode of I Love Lucy, for example. Um, but this is uh, also the period when we really begin to see Delis merging uh, onto the into with Hollywood and in, in a sort of big way. So um, one, this is from the exhibition. We have a photo from the film Change of Habit. Uh, there's a photo from the set with Elvis Presley. Change of Habit starred Mary Tyler Moore and Ed Nasner. Uh, here, Elvis is with deli employee Joe Gus at Glassman's Deli and Market in Los Angeles. So this relationship between pop culture and deli extended beyond Hollywood to the arts and celebrity in general. Uh, here, famously Guns N' Roses at Cancer's Deli in the Kibitz Room on Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles. Dozens of other TV shows and movies have since mentioned Jewish delis or set scenes um, in Jewish delis, such as uh, Broadway, Danny Rose, of course, Woody Allen, 1984, Carnegie Deli, uh, Donnie Brasco, 1997, Katz's Deli with um, Johnny, Johnny Depp, uh, Seinfeld, of course, and more recently, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, and of course, perhaps most famously of all, we, here we are back to um, Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan, When Harry Met Sally, 1989. So why Jewish Deli? What is it about the Jewish Deli? Uh, Jewish Deli has an outsized meaning in pop culture. Deli conveys something visceral, universal, beloved. It's also one of the most accessible forms of Jewish culture for both Jews and non-Jews. Where does this leave us today? The deli is no longer a Jewish restaurant. It is an American restaurant. It's not, I mean, it is, a, it's no longer just a Jewish restaurant. It is an American restaurant and a Jewish restaurant. It is an American restaurant, particularly because of its outsized place in pop culture. At the same time, it is a visible symbol of Jewish culture much like this synagogue that we are in today. However, unlike this synagogue, it is a truly public place open to all visitors and tourists. In New York, for example, Americans and tourists visit Jewish jellies like Katz's every day. Yet because food is so wrapped up in memory, identity, and nostalgia, delis have a lot more meaning than just a place to eat particularly for Jews. In fact, some Jews consider the deli a secular synagogue. So these are some of the concepts we explore and some of the history we explore in the exhibition. I'll share some photographs from the actual exhibition when it opened uh, originally in Los Angeles in April of 2022. Uh, this was the opening hall um, when you first came into the exhibition. How, how, how many of you actually went to the exhibition in New York? So many of you are familiar, okay. So this was in, in Los Angeles um, in, in at the Skirball Cultural Center. So, so, so it actually originated, it was it was um, created by the Skirball Cultural Center. I was, I was um, hired by the Skirball Cultural Center to uh, create the exhibition with two Skirball Cultural Center um, curators. Um, and so we created it for the Skirball Center and then now it's touring the rest of the country and after Skirball, it went to New York. So, um, so this is what it looked like when it opened in, at Skirball and then every place that it goes, it has a, a few items that are local to that city as well. Um, so anyway, this is, um, these are some, actually, these are some, I think these are some uniforms that were from, um, some delis in uh, Los Angeles, the, like Factors. This is, I don't think this made it to New York. This is from Factors, famous deli. I don't know if anyone's ever gone to Factors in Los Angeles on Pico Boulevard. It's one, it's a local deli in Los Angeles. So, so we got some uniforms from the deli there. Um, and I don't know if this neon side made it to Los Angeles as well. This is also a local um, neon side from, from Studio City. Um, 
so we worked with the neon museum of neon in, in Los Angeles and then the San Fernando Valley to, to develop some of the artifacts in the museum and some of them, uh, in the exhibition, some of them made it to New York and some of them were replaced by, uh, objects that, that the New York historical society was able to source here, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so Billy's is also a, I believe that's also a, a, a deli in, in Los Angeles area that closed. This is a really interesting piece. I don't, I think it made it, it was made it to New York as well. This is, um, I don't know if you saw it in New York, the uh, cigarette, the original cigarette dispenser, dispenser from Cantor's Deli. Um, I believe it was in the New York version of the exhibition as well. I, I, that's an amazing piece. So Cantor's has, it's basically its own archive of, of, of all their stuff from Fairfax Avenue. Like I think it's above the restaurant, like sitting there in its own museum, essentially, or our own archive. And this is one of the things that we were able to find and and um, restore for the exhibition. Uh, I think there was some old cigarettes still in there. So anyway, this is uh, one of the pieces that we were able to salvage for the exhibition. Um, so this is um, another thing we explore in the exhibition is election day. Um, which is pertinent to this week because I know there's some elections happening in some state in New Jersey and some states. Uh, so I, I want to think of I want to um, spend a few minutes talking about this topic because um, we can all think of examples of candidates, mayoral, presidential, as having photo ops in restaurants. Um, but this also includes Jewish delicatessens, and this is something that we uh, devoted some space to in the exhibition as well. I don't know if you remember seeing that in the exhibition. Um, in this slide, for example, we have John Edwards and then Senator Barack Obama at Manny's Deli in Chicago in August 2004. I share this photo in particular because um, the exhibition just opened uh, two weeks ago in Chicago at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And we, now that it opened in Chicago, of course, there's some material that's Illinois specific. And we have a lot of material from Manny's Deli in the exhibition there. It, and, and if you see here, we have some stuff from Manny's originally in the exhibition from its original uh, opening in Los Angeles, but in Chicago, there's even more. Now Manny's is, has been in the Raskin family for four generations since it opened in 1942, but it's, it's an, it's a common stop on the campaign trail. So um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, interesting. We'll discuss this in a, in a moment, but here's another uh, photo. Here's governor Jerry Brown campaigning outside of Cantor's deli on Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles in 1976. So if these candidates uh, just wanted the Jewish vote, they might choose a place like this synagogue or a Jewish community center, right, for a, for a photo op. But instead, we see Jewish delis as frequent stops on the campaign trail. This is something we see across the country. Um, in my opinion, this is quite interesting. Um, and it it says something, again, about the, uh, pu the publicly American and Jewish uh, identity of a Jewish deli. By choosing Jewish delis, these candidates show that they can be American uh, while eating a pastrami sandwich, right? There's something uh, about that visible display of Jewish identity within an American institution of the Jewish deli that um, is appealing. I think maybe it's something we could talk about in the in the uh, Q and A, um, but I wanted to share also some some uh, photos from the exhibition in New York. This is a photo of me and my daughter <laughs> uh, when it opened in New York. Uh, my daughter as pastrami. We I don't know if you saw when you open, come to the exhibition, you can you can put on. We wanted something immersive or something experiential where you can also take part in the exhibition. Um, and my son as he's walking into the exhibition. So here's some of the material that we got from locally from Second Avenue Deli. This is the marquee from the original Second Avenue Deli when it was on Second Avenue. Um, so that's the original neon sign. Uh, here are some costumes from Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the same original costumes that we were able to secure. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts of the exhibition. Um, this is Shokun and Sampuru which is the Japanese term for plastic food, plastic display food. So one of the things that we really grappled with when we were playing in the exhibition was how to, uh, we, you know, we didn't want to recreate the Jewish deli, but we wanted people, you know, many of the visitors who come to this exhibition, these are in obviously public museums, 
uh, are people who have never been to a Jewish deli or who don't visit Jewish delis as frequently as as uh, maybe Jewish people do or who who visit a Jewish deli as a tourist or maybe once or twice in their life. But we really wanted them to understand what Jewish food was and what the Jewish deli was. And, you know, we, we worked on this exhibition for two or three years and we wanted we kept sort of struggling with the idea that the exhibition is a the Jewish deli is a multi-sensory ex experience. You know, when you go to a Jewish deli, how do you evoke that experience of being shoved and as you wait in line and the smells and the steam and, you know, the, the cacophony of pots and pans and the whole experience of walking into a Jewish deli, right? And of course, the food, the taste. So we couldn't, we couldn't really, um, we couldn't, uh, you know, we, 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 um, we thought about there is, there is some, uh, I don't know much about it, but there is a movement in a museum, in the museum world to have perfume samples so you can smell things. Uh, so we thought about that and having domes where you could smell things, but then the exhibition opened, um, it, 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 it was supposed to open in May, 2020. So, it, you know, it was, we thought about having perfume samples under domes and having but um in the end we didn't do any of that and we we landed on this we landed on shokun and sampuru because at least we could sort of have the food in the exhibition so that they could sort of see it in the most real and vivid way possible um so we have a whole wall for those of you that saw the exhibition we have a whole wall of uh, or a whole table actually of of some of the food and i think some of it is mounted on the wall if i remember correctly um, to sort of give people a sense of the food that's there. Anyway, so that's um, that's the exhibition. And um, it's on, it was at the New York Historical Society, as you know, then it went to Houston to the Holocaust Museum. And now, as I said, it's at Illinois, uh, the Illinois Holocaust Museum through April, 2024. And then it goes to Washington, to, to DC, to the Capitol Jewish Museum. Uh, anyway, you can find all the information online. So to close, I want to talk a little bit about the future of Jewish Delhi, because there's a lot of talk about the death of the Jewish Delhi. Um, but I think there are um, some trends in Jewish Delhi life that I want to to address. And, um, you know, I, I think if you look at the history of Jewish Delhi as a history of tradition and of change, as I outlined in the beginning, then these current trends in, in the Jewish Delhi world um, are kind of, to me, the latest shifts of of those kinds of um changes and they there's a trope that the jewish deli is dying but to me the jewish deli has always been evolving and so these latest changes are just the latest iterations of those changes so some of those some of these trends right now one trend that has been uh ongoing i would say for a good 10 to 15 years maybe even 20 years is the artisanal deli uh, so this is a return to the old world traditions of actually of Europe, uh, pre-industrialization. Uh, I think of Milan and Delhi, of General Muir in Atlanta, of Mamala's bagel in the Boston area. More recently, this is handmade, hand-rolled bagels. Um, so this is cropping up in cities all over North America, really. Uh, another trend in the deli world is the legacy deli. Uh, so maintaining the American traditions um, and the architectural heritage of American delis like Katz's, Langer's Deli in Los Angeles, uh, Manny's in Chicago, uh, Russ and Daughters. So maintaining the traditions of decades old, or in some cases over a century old, um, uh, truly American institutions, um, heritage legacy institutions. Um the future of Jewish deli, the third trend that I would say. I spent a lot of time today talking about beef, right? <laughs> and if you want to sort of, if you want to sort of uh, summarize the 20th century of Jewish deli, you could summarize it in one word, right? Beef. <laughs> but if you want to talk about the direction of the 21st century for Jewish deli, I would summarize it with another word, and that would be vegan, right? That would be plant based. So uh, one example is Unreal Deli. The owner is Jenny Goldfarb, if you don't already know about it. Her great-grandfather was in the deli business, but Goldfarb herself is vegan. 
She wanted to create uh, a plant-based corned beef alternative with beets, wheat, chickpeas, spices, etc. She had a successful run on Shark Tank a few years ago. She earned several investors. And so her vegan deli company, Unreal Deli, is now on grocery store shelves nationwide at Publix, Whole Foods, Costco. By the end of 2022, her company had revenues of $40 million, according to some reports for 2022. Another example, uh, Ben and Esther's, if you know about this deli, it's a chain, it's a vegan deli chain on the West Coast based in Portland with locations across the West Coast down to San Diego and Los Angeles. They regularly have lineups out the door, celebrities uh, posting on Instagram and TikTok about their sandwiches. They make all kinds of bagels, Everything bagels, garlic, poppy, pumpernickel, schmears, smears like cream cheese, lox, bacon scallion, carrot lox, white fish, Reuben sandwiches, brisket, club sandwiches, tuna melt, matzo ball soup, all of it vegan, all of it meat and fish free, all of it plant based. So Delhi continues to evolve and change. This is an image from their Seattle. Uh, I think this is their Seattle store. Um, as and and. Delhi continues to evolve and change to reflect the larger cultural trends of this country. So I, I hope I have made it clear uh, through this history uh, up to today that Jewish Delhi is part of the fabric of this nation. And although Jewish Delhi has European roots, Jewish Delhi is an American phenomenon. And as we have seen, Jewish Delis have become part of the cultural and urban landscape of this country. And when we look at delicatessen, we see one example of the indelible mark Jews have made on this country and that they continue to make today. Thank you. I will now take some questions. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the question is, as a curator, do I personally go and help install the exhibition and look for the local materials and all that? I haven't personally been doing that. There's a whole team. I am one of three co-curators who who um, built this exhibition, who, who created this exhibition. Um, my two co-curators, Kate Thurston and Laura Mart, are, um, they were more involved with the um, collection of actual, with the, um, sourcing of actual um, objects. So they were more involved with that aspect. Um, so they were more involved with that part. Now, in terms of actually going to the other places, I did go to New York when it, I did come to New York when it opened and I was there for the opening. I don't know if any of you were there for the opening, but um, I, so I, I'm not, and then in, in terms of installing it, actually the mechanics of installing it, it's each institution does that. In terms of finding materials in some cases I have just in terms of relationships, like with Manny's, I was involved a little bit um, in Houston. It was Kenny and Ziggy. So Ziggy Gruber was heavily involved with in the Houston. I don't know if any of you have been to Houston and Ziggy's. And, I mean, it's just, it just depends on the place um, and how much local stuff they want, but because Skirball is also um, it's a Skirball born exhibition. So they're just, it's, it's a whole institutional thing that, the way museum, I don't know if you're in the museum world, but that's how that, yeah. So that's how they're more involved with it than I'm, I was more of an independent curator that came in because of just my so-called expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I think that, okay, I think there's two different questions. Yeah, okay. So first of all, are you relating the question about anti-Semitism to today? Is that why you're thinking about it? 
historically. Okay. Um, so historically the relationship between Jewish delis and anti-Semitism, you know, I, I didn't ever, we didn't come across anything in our research. Um, you know, it's, are you thinking about it in terms of Hollywood specifically, or are you thinking about it in terms of on the street, anti-Semitism public? Cause gentlemen's agreement is are you thinking about it more in terms of the relationship between Hollywood and Delhi and just in terms of the actual cultural anti-Semitism? You know, I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't know that the level of anti-Semitism, I don't, I mean, besides the cultural, I'm not a historian of anti-Semitism, first of all. Um, but we did not, I have not come across instances besides casual anti-Semitism that I would expect to find. I mean, we have a section in the, I mean, hmm. Not to the extent that it is today. Not nearly to the extent that it is today. Yeah. And then the second question. Um, you mean like would a gel like in the same way that a Chinese restaurant would open in a yeah. Um I don't believe so. I mean, I I I, I can't I can't think of an example. I mean, there's Nashville, for example, Jewish Delhi. You know, they're always um, but there's a small community there, you know. So um in every case where we've seen Jewish delis, there's a small community at least to, you know, I don't ever I can't think of an example of a Jewish deli opening where there's no Jewish community to buy those products. You know, the example of Rubens opening in near Broadway, you know there's already a Jewish community in New York, obviously, whether or not, you know, so, but that, that wouldn't be the example that you're thinking of, you know, so I don't think so. You know, those are two really good questions though. Yeah. Uh, in the back, we have a zoom question. I, it looks like right. yes. we from our zoom room, Jeffrey is wondering that you mentioned kosher going out of style. Yes. And somewhere along the line, non-kosher items appearing on menus like cheesecake and corned beef on yes. the same menu. So he has always been intrigued to walk into almost any Jewish deli and observe this phenomenon and is curious, can you provide any additional context on the when, the how, and the why that happened? I mean, I, <laughs> there's, you know, there's this idea that, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that, that, I mean, Rabbi Berman can probably, you could probably back me up on this, but um, there's there's an idea that Jews, Jewish immigrants were kosher from the moment they got off the boat here, you know, but that is not the case. Uh, the history of kosher in America uh, is not as, is not as direct as we might think it has. It has gone in all kinds of zigs and zags. So it's hard to, you know, it's, it's not a direct, uh, uh, it's, it's a very complicated past, but, um, I guess the question is when, when would Jewish delis have become, become not kosher? Um, I think, you know, I think the general gist is that they were originally kosher style. Let's we would call it kosher style to this day in this sort of parlance. Um, it's a very complicated past. There's no uh, the problem with it with with me answering this directly is that there's no real archives. There's no uh, empirical record of who was kosher when, when was which restaurant had kosher meat, which one didn't have kosher meat, which, which one was, you know, so it's, I'm giving you a, a, a nuance. I'm trying to give you a nuanced answer because there's no, you know, direct understanding of who was putting what in their mouth, who was putting what on the table, what restaurant at what time in what, you know, 
it's like kind of like today asking you who's using canned tomatoes, who's using fresh tomatoes, who's use. It's a very complicated thing to have an understanding of. Um, but the general gist is that at some point in the mid 20th century, as uh, secularization and uh, Judaism becomes more uh, multi-denominational, a non-kosher uh, lifestyle becomes more uh, normative. So maybe one um, yes. precise moment that we can pin it to. Do you know, based on menus, based yeah. on recipe books, when you would see the first Reuben sandwich? Well, I mean, it, Ru Arnold Reubens, <laughs> uh, mid-century, when we, I mean, the early, by 1940s, 1930s, we begin to see, I don't know the first Reuben sandwich. I can't pin that down, but- Certainly by the mid-century, mid-20th century, you begin to see that on menus at Jewish restaurants. It all depends on what you define as a Jewish restaurant, what you define as, I mean, some people don't, I mean, we, as curators, we had a lot of discussion about what is a Jewish deli? You know, what had, do you, is Rubens even included? You know, a lobster on the menu, you know, I mean, so it really depends on how you, where you draw the line in all these conversations. Um, you know, Nathan's hot dog, is that a deli? You know, do, you, do I consider Nathan's hot dog on the streets of New York? Is that, is that the remnant of Jewish deli? Do you really consider Jewish deli dying when Nathan's hot dog are on the corner of every street, every street corner in New York City? Right? So it, how you think about what you define as a Jewish deli and, and what you define as history and, of course, information. We're in an era where this is a war of, you know, so, Yeah. Yes. 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 In the back. Oh, we're going to send a mic. Since the questions are getting longer than Lara can um, very easily synopsize, um, we're going to add the microphone to the conversation. Uh, you talked about all the big cities, yes. the New Yorks, Los Angeles, but the second tier. Yes. And I'm from the East Coast, yes. so it would be, I'm thinking of places like Providence, Rhode Island, Worcester, Massachusetts, which all had well-known delis. Yes. And- the whole middle of the country yes. and the Jews of the South and the Jews of the South uh, through the reform movement, I was on a, a board and we dealt with the small congregations and the Jews of the South and they would have to go to Memphis to do anything that they had to do to get any kind of Jewish food. And I wondered if, I don't know if there are other Jewish delis that sprung up in those communities later on because this was just about the big cities uh, in what periods are you talking about i'm talking about from the 1940s the 1940s on yeah absolutely we have we, we have all that we have many many of those cities in, in the exhibition and in in the history absolutely there's a really good book if you're interested in this um david Sachs has a book called save the deli um which which outlines a lot of those early delis as well I recommend it if you if you are interested in this in that past, um, and um, yeah, we we go through some of the Jews in the South. There's you know there's a really uh, fascinating period of the civil rights movement um, and Jewish delis and um, and and where Jewish deli owners uh, landed on both sides of of the movement. Uh, and we address that in the exhibition as well. Just didn't have time to get into it today. I would say that the Jewish deli 
It was really an extension of the neighborhood local uh, kind of like candy store where you could sit at the counter and order something. This was for the Jewish people in the neighborhood who were kosher. And it then expanded as the neighborhood expanded to, uh, uh, as it expanded, it was, um, the neighborhood expanded. And so you uh, brought in uh, non-kosher style foods where you could have milk with your coffee <laughs> kind of thing. And that's how it expanded. You could have a kosher deli serving Hebrew national meats, and you could have kosher style deli a few stores down serving Hebrew national meats, but also cheese and other things. So it depended on your neighborhood. I, I love that. I love the um the reference to the candy store as well. You know, one thing I'm 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 working on now, like my next project is really like beyond the deli, right? You know, because there were so many restaurants besides Jewish delis that I'm sure many of you remember or um, can think back to a period when there were Jewish restaurants besides or Jewish places to go for food, for eating besides the Jewish deli, right? The Jewish deli has taken on this, uh, this outsized role in the Jewish culinary imagination, but there was you remember, the soda shop, the candy shop, the dairy restaurant. I know Ben Catcher has written a book about that. Um, but there were so many other Jewish spaces, um, public spaces. Uh, you know, uh, the, so, the, the candy shop, pharmacy, soda counter, seltzer, the, all those things were um, sort of, to me, could overlap, right? Um, and, and the deli was part of that landscape, I think, too. Uh, for some reason, the deli sort of won, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Maybe it's the meat. I don't know. Um, yet to be explored or, you know, for some of the reasons I might have outlined today. Um, but I think that's such an important part of um, American culinary history um, that has made its way into sort of menus and food, uh, American food diner culture, but is still, you know, has yet to be written, I think. Maybe we have time for a couple more. Yeah. Did women have any role in the did women have any role in the evolution of delis? The only reference I can think of is a very recent one, and that's Russ and Daughters. Yeah. But were we behind the scenes in any possible way? No, Russ and Daughters is a very early reference because it's such an old institution. You know, it's it's uh, I think it's over a hundred. Uh, it's in our exhibition. It's not technically a Jewish deli. Actually, it goes back to what I was just talking about. It's an appetizing shop. Um, but, um, we think of it as a Jewish deli because it's kind of getting lumped into that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a really interesting question about gender in general, uh, and women, I think, especially in the early days, these were family run businesses. So I think women were in some way involved. Right. Um, but on the other hand, I think when we think of deli, it's a deli man, right? It's a, it's the man. So we thought about this a lot when we were planning the exhibition, because actually we're three women who curated this exhibition and we're very, you know, but we just kept coming across these deli men. And how do we think about women and women's role in this, in this story? Um, but, um, you know, of course there's women involved in some, in a lot of these stories where it's a family run business, we see women owners, women co-owners in a few of the different, uh, businesses that we looked at. Um, and 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 I think you know, looking at the name of the exhibition, I'll have what she's having, right? Um, and the way that has been sort of portrayed and and uh, understood in this very male way, it's a question that we're still thinking about in a lot of ways, right? How does gender, marvelous Mrs. Maisel, this deli question, you know, um, it's still something that I'm thinking about to answer your question, you know, the, how does gender, uh, you know, standing up here, I'm still thinking about it to answer your question, really, you know, what is, what, where, where do women fit in? How, how do, what gender, what is the, what is the, it's a question I, I'm still ruminating over. Yeah. It's a good question though. Um, what is considered the golden age? So uh, what years? 
so when I talk about the golden era, it's that mid-century, it's that post-war, uh, the war years, it's that era of suburbanization, of leaving the cities, of Jewish growth, uh, of of growth in many different kinds of ways, of economic population, um, Jewish growth. Uh, it was a period of population growth in general um, and Jewish population growth and, and, and economic growth in general. So that also translated into um, business growth in the, in the country. So that meant that many, many delis were open at that period as well. And, and, you know, when we think about Jewish delis closing, uh, you know, when, when we think about a golden period, it means, you know, at a certain point it ended. <laughs> so, you know, in, in, at some point in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, there was some kind of a decline. Um, and we see that decline across the board in, in Jewish life. Um, and uh, Delhi's in some ways experienced that decline as well. Although I think some of the things that I've talked about today might interrogate that paradigm in some ways. Yes. Yeah, we could do a couple more questions. Yeah. So we're going to officially end the program right now and thank our folks who joined us on Zoom for being with us. Thank everybody who came in person. Um, but uh, Lara is willing to hang out for a little bit. So if you have more questions, come on up, introduce yourself and uh, share those questions with her, with me, with each other. Thank you so much for coming to our first Lunch and Learn of the year. Thank there are so many much. more to come every other month this year. Keep your eyes open for more opportunities. And the food will match the topic just about every time. Thanks for being here. Thank you.